call the finance committee meeting to order at 728. Um, we have, I believe it's four action items and then one discussion item um, on the docket today. Uh, the action items are um, all contractual, uh, well, three contracts and one bond. So uh, we'll start off with uh, minutes. So um, finance committee recommends that the minutes of the March 9th meeting um, be approved as presented. Second. All right, I was just moving people from the finance committee onto the panel here. So I think we're now all convened. Um, so Halpern? Yes. Tanya Vudi? Yes. Kim? Yes. And good to see everybody who just joined us, Kathy, Raphael, John. Um, the Nutrition Services Satellite Meal Agreement, uh, we do this annually. This is an awesome uh, partnership with district team. Um, so uh, Raphael, Kathy, anything um, in here that's unique or different from previous years or anything you wanna say as it relates to the Nutrition Services Agreement? Nothing is different. This is the standard contract that we normally sign. And I believe uh, Kate Mason Schultz is online too. She's the coordinator of nutritional service and support. I and am, I'm here, I'm here. Um, really, the only significant change this year is our 2% um, increase from $1.84 per meal to $1.88 per meal. Um, this is typical of a, of a increase from year to year. So that is really the only noteworthy thing um, on the contract. And the only other fee that's in the contract that might not be something that um, is in other nutrition services ones is that we, we pay the uh, daily rate if we're tapping into nutrition services on a day that ETHS is not in session. Um, whereas if we had a, a food vendor that wasn't also a school, um, they would just be on our schedule, but that's a $650 daily rate, correct? Correct. Right. Right. And I just want to point out if we had uh, engaged a private contractor, the cost would have been higher than the, uh, the strategic partnership that we have with the high school. Mm -hmm. oh, this, is a, this is a great uh, agreement, so thank you. Um, any other questions? Sula Ranya or any other board member, Biz? Um, I apologize if it was in the language and I don't know if it's appropriate to be in the language since this is an annual contract, but because we have had to reimagine our food distribution during this e-learning phase and it is entirely likely that that will have to happen again at some point. Do we have any language that we need to be explicit about about how we work together if school is not in session? So what we ordinarily would do, they prepare the food anyway. What we normally do, we have a transportation uh, to members of our staff who provide, who transport the food from the high school to our site. So that will continue to be the case. So that wouldn't, that would change. All right, I just didn't know if we needed it to be contract, like any contingencies in the contract, since that is a likely scenario to make sure that we're all on the same page of how that should work. In like the some kind of intergovernmental agreement on how the high school, District 65 and the city uh, operate to get food distributed to families that need it? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't necessarily think that there needs to be anything in this contract, but we do have a very good working relationship. Um, we're working together now to provide, um, provide meals to the community. So um, any, anything that comes up and any um, you know, advisement from the state or um, school nutrition association, things like that, as far as how, um, you know, how we can best provide meals come fall, um, we'll work together to, to make sure that we're doing that. I got, I, I'm going to push as a consultant who has learned the hard way many times to have things in writing. I, it's, I, there's no suggestion that the working relationships are a problem currently, but I think it's something we want to consider having explicit language for all of us to agree on because I, I think this is a scenario that we will, we will 
revisit and if if the players that are currently involved transition out of their roles making sure that we have explicit commitment between the organizations to make sure that vulnerable folks are fed is something I, i'd like us to think about sure i i i would agree with that um i think we can um, I can talk to the high school and um, see if there's something that makes sense for us to put in place at this point. I guess it's, I guess it's completely possible that um, you know we rely on both uh, the high school and um, the city to get food to our families right now, um, and it, it would be possible for the city to say, you know what, we can't do this anymore, and do we have a contingency plan for a what kind of lead time they have to give us if that were to be the case and then what the operation looks like if we have to take it on is that kind of where you're going biz yeah and you know i would assume that we would never need any of these things in writing and we all work on good faith and everybody has the same goals but if we followed that we wouldn't have any contracts in anything so i think having some kind of um written commitment uh, that everybody you know collaborates to make sure that they're on the same page with the language so that if you know if we continue to have a shortfall in the city budget and then the city budget has to make adjustment all you know all of us are going to be facing financial constraints and i just want to make sure that food for vulnerable families doesn't end up on the table for any one of us as a possible thing to, to restrict. I just want to point out that the relationship that we have with the city, with a high school now, the city has no hand in preparing the food. All the city is doing is they're paying for the high school to prepare the food. So if for whatever reason, the city decides to fall out and not distribute the food, actually not host the food sites anymore, we can easily host them in our buildings without having to do anything differently. We just need for the city to notify us that it will no longer host them at the fall food distribution site, and we can continue to host them on our sites and make sure that the families and kids are fed. So um, I have noticed that um, on the District 65 uh, parents Facebook page that parents have said that sometimes that food has run out. And um, I just don't know if, if there's a backup plan for when that happens, because I mean, we're talking about vulnerable families and how important that is. And, you know, I don't want to see any of our, our families miss meals. So I don't know um, if that's been addressed. I haven't seen it as much lately, but I mean, I have seen that in the last few weeks, a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think it took us a few weeks to, you know, kind of find a sweet spot as far as the numbers go. We you know, obviously want all of all of those meals to be distributed and, you know, we don't want to waste food in all of this. So um, right now uh, we, we seem to have hit that spot, but um, I would say, you know, on the day of there's not a, um, you know, there's, we send out a certain, a certain number of meals and um, we can adjust for the next week um, or like, uh, I believe it was the second week we started this, we sent out an additional offering midweek. So it is something that, you know, if the city runs out early, we rely on communication from them to let us know that we need to increase meals. And then um, we have, we, that's what we have done in the past thus far. Any other questions? Well, I, I would just echo business concern with there not being any language specific to this um, that we could fall back on. And, you know, there is reference to hot, uh, three hot meals. And of course we're not providing hot meals right now, but, um, and we're also providing possibly more meals than we, we would be during the school year. So I think in terms of financing and accountability, how, you know, how do we ensure that that's well documented um, in for for these types of scenarios, I know that the the agreement is pretty standard to previous years, but um, it would be helpful to have something in writing to refer to people. Um, you know the questions that we had earlier on around the meal selections, and um, you know somebody that's not going to look through that whole um, you know docket of of contracting. How do we explain to them that you know these this is what we have, um, especially if there's at all any possibility of having to quarantine again um, in in the fall. 
So just to echo if there could be some language around what we have done and how we um, will ensure that um, that you know how that's how that contract is different um, under these circumstances. I think it would be helpful to have something in writing. Yeah, and I think what I'm what I'm hearing, and um, again, Biz Rebecca, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. It sounds like we have this nutrition services agreement, which is how we're going to operate schools in session, how we're going to uh, feed the kids um, as we've done in the past, and the separate might be in, in another um, another intergovernmental type agreement that simply memorializes the ways that this has worked best that we're hoping it can work in the future um, to continue servicing uh, meals to families um, so that we all have some expectations to to live by. And if people say, how is this going to work? And I, I think it's fair for people, whether it's uh, community members asking city government or people asking us as the providers of the meals, um, how's this supposed to work for everybody to have the same information that they're telling people? We will reach out to our partners at the high school and also to the city and come out with, uh, with an MOU. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with no other questions, um, the committee recommends that the intergovernmental agreement allowing District 202 ETHS to furnish meals in bulk to 10 elementary schools and Dr. Bessie Road School in District 65 for the 2020-2021 school year be presented to the full board for approval. Second. Um, Hill Pern? Yes. Tanya Budi? Yes. Kim? Yes. All right, positive connections, uh, transportation contract extension. I feel like we've had a roller coaster of a relationship uh, the past few months. So uh, Raphael, if you can give us um, kind of an update on how we went from uh, tug of war with them at the beginning of this uh, stay at home order to uh, an extension, that'd be great. I'm just going to thank you. I'm just going to start out by saying that uh, the company actually sent out a nice letter to the superintendent and myself today, where they actually thank the board and the district for coming through and making sure they can keep the employees in place by paying them and also making sure the infrastructures are in place so that when we start up, we'll be able to run transportation. Can I interrupt you for a second? I think, I don't know, I think most of our board members know. But there was a point here where um, where Positive Connections was going to let go the bus drivers that live they in our let go the bus drivers. They actually they were let go the bus them. drivers, and uh, Raphael put together a pretty good professional size hissy fit, making sure that uh, that wasn't going to happen. So uh, thank you, Raphael, for your work with them to to push them to keep uh, our people taken care of. Thank you. So what we have there in front of you is the modified uh, pricing, if you will. We did an RFP back in January and Positive Connection came back with an increase of 36.5 from this year to next year and then subsequent years. They wanted five and a half uh, increases for the, for the subsequent mm -hmm. years. And we had been in negotiation back and forth, back and forth with them and we were able to get it down to 15%, which is still high, but since they were the only bidder, our options were somewhat limited. So that's what we agreed to. So the increase from this year to next year will be 15%. And then uh, we have one more year of, of uh, increase of 3.5%, and we have an option of an additional year at 3.5%. The thinking on our side is we are hoping that between now and the next three years, we're in a position to be able to develop a partnership, a relationship with a competitive provider that can then uh, push or nudge or provide the opportunity for the district to get better pricing in the out years. That's the plan. And I think we also talk about the possibility of looking at uh, maybe adjusting a bell time that will also result in some reduction in pricing. 15% is pretty steep, but I think we were limited in the options that we have to be able to, uh, to get the pricing down. 
So that's what you have in front of. Uh, thank you. And you mentioned that this was the only bidder to respond, which obviously limits the options. Um, but this is a company that is uh, reputable in the area. Their corporate office is in New Jersey, correct? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, and they also but, have a region out of uh, Fond du Lac in Wisconsin. So those are the folks that we deal with, which is kind of like the Midwest region. Great. Thank you. Any questions about this from any board members? Or yeah, members? I just, I'm just i just curious why there weren't any other bidders uh, this time around. Like what are some of the issues that, that prevents other bidders, uh, other uh, companies from making a bid? Honestly, it seems like the school transportation space is somewhat of a monopoly. Mm -hmm. We actually reach out to 30 something different firms. We ask them to please bid. There was a provision in the RAP that we said we're willing to adjust that requires a bidding company to have a depot in Evanston. We were willing to modify that to make it 10 miles within 10 miles of the city of Evanston. So we, we did a lot of work to try to get someone else to bid on it. And a bunch of folks picked packages. But at the end of the day, only positive connections submitted a bid. This is not unusual in school districts in Northern Illinois and even all over the state of Illinois, where you have, I'm assuming it's a non-complete clause, whereby the transportation company makes the decision not to bid, even though we do everything we can to encourage them to bid. And we found this out. So that's kind of where we find ourselves. We did everything we could. We called all all kinds of transportation companies. We even reached out to companies that uh, that I've had relationship with prior, prior to now when I worked at CPS to try to get them to bid on it. And they showed interest, but at the end of the day, we only got one bid submitted. Raphael, could you also explain how the number of companies has dwindled significantly as far as the parent companies are there? So, Thank you, Phil. Bus transportation company as it stands right now, all over this country, and even in Canada, there are really three companies that owns all the transportation company. So you have First Student, you have uh, STA, which is the owner of Positive Connection. And I think you have, I'm trying to remember another one, another major one. And then you have a small mom and pop operation, such as Compass Transportation. They do some work for us on the Head Start grant. And they also do some work, but they don't, Compress doesn't have the ability to be able to pick up the level of service that we need for our general transportation. We talk to them, we encourage the owners of Compass to try to get them to be in there. They showed up for the bid uh, distribution. They also showed up for the bid open, but it didn't submit a bid. So there's a monopoly in the marketplace when you have three major owners in the US and Canada running bus transportation. And so with, with, you know, the mom and pop shops aren't big enough to take on the work. If we created a staggered start in some school situations that might lessen the number of routes simultaneously running and create an opportunity for some uh, different size companies to, to bid in the future, but uh, we're not there yet. Right. And those are the things that we're thinking about. If we can, if it's possible for us to modify our start time slightly, then we can break up the bid into chunks. So instead of needing one big company to be able to run everything, we can chunk it whereby we break the uh, transportation into different regions and then bid it accordingly. So you encourage the smaller firm to be able to get in there and be able to compete with the big boys. So I think that, um, you know, definitely sounds like an interesting idea to explore. Um, obviously something that's going to require um, a fair amount of stakeholder engagement and opportunity for feedback before we, we develop the plan or, or move forward on it. Um, one other question that I had, um, and I guess this is similar to what Biz uh, and Rebecca raised with the, the nutrition agreement is um, what I, I didn't like, is there a language in this contract or that we can put in this contract to contemplate? Because again, I think as we talked about last week at our meeting, um, I think we can imagine that there's gonna be a scenario again uh, in the upcoming school year 
where school may be um, closed for a period of time or maybe we'll have uh, you know, staggered attendance or, or something that that is gonna affect transportation and our, our, the number of buses we need and when we need them. So are we contemplating that at all in this agreement? So there is um, in item two, section C of the contract, um, the contract is written assuming a minimum of 176 mm -hmm. operating days per year. And it basically referenced, uh, Raphael, tell me if I'm reading this wrong, um, <laughs> that if the actual number of days um, falls below 176 during the school year, then the parties agree to negotiate in good faith the rates provided. And I think um, this is a perfect example of what we're going through right now, where Positive Connections' first move was to let the, let the drivers go. And those drivers are community members. Those are people who live in Evanston. They have kids that go to our schools. And Raphael went back to them in good faith and said, we'd like to keep these people employed. Can we, can we pay for that, uh, that end of the contract? And they agreed to it. And um, that, that, is in, uh, that is in the contract. Was there something more specific that you're hoping for, Sunni? Well, yeah, I mean, because I, I think we we don't know. It, it might not just be closures, right? It could be staggered attendance. Like, I, I, I'm not sure that we fully understand what the next school year is going to look like and what our transportation needs. You know, we might maybe we'll have some kids coming in the morning and some in the afternoon, or I, I don't know. Um, and I would imagine that is going to affect bus routes and when we need buses and all of that sort of thing. So you know, I appreciate that language. And I think that's big. Is there anything that we can be a little bit more proactive knowing that next school year is, it's highly unlikely that it's going to look like a typical year. I think we can always, I think that's a wonderful idea. We can always put an amendment or an addendum to the existing contract that speaks to the fact that we have this pandemic here and if there has to be a change in the school scheduling, we can amend the contract to reflect that. And on the back end, then we can work out what the terms of, of, of that will look like. So we can actually put it in before the, we, the board approves it at the next board meeting. So by all means, it's worth doing. Okay. I mean, I, I, I think that seems like it would be prudent to do that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great John idea. John has a comment. Probably. And then after John, I'd like to, I have a comment as well. Thank you. I had um, two questions first. Um, when we talk about um, that we reached out to Positive Connection, so the portion that we paid, was that like a discounted rate, pretty much just covering the salary of the bus drivers? How, what did that That's, look like? That was what the, uh, the complex uh, negotiation was. Mm -hmm. Initially, Positive wanted the same amount of money they've always invoiced us all along. And from our point of view, we thought that would be an unjust enrich enrichment because they weren't earning the profit that it ordinarily would earn during the regular year. They weren't buying gas. So what we agree, what we propose that Positive eventually agreed to is to do a reimbursement of actual expenditure that is directly tied to our contract. For example, we'll pay a base amount for bus drivers for their regular transportation. We also will pay for the insurance on the buses that are servicing us. We also pay for depreciation we pay for the managers who are actually related to supervising the drivers. We pay for related costs that are, that are tied to dispatch. So the payment that we made is actually reimbursement right. as opposed to a base amount. So if they don't make those suspenses, we don't pay. That's what was written out in the contract. And from what I heard you saying earlier, that was important because otherwise this infrastructure that we have wouldn't be in place at the start of the next school year and we, if, if the school year were to start, which who knows what's gonna happen next year, as we've said, we wouldn't be prepared to be able to bust those students to where they need to be. I think you are more likely than not. I think the, the decision serve both parties. If we had decided we weren't paying their drivers and uh, it's a very good possibility, they may not have the cash flow to right. be able to continue to operate. And since they were the only bidder anyway, it's a good chance they might've gone out of business. So a decision was made, it was a win-win from where we were sitting. It helped them and it also helped us to make sure that it continued to be a going concern. That seems reasonable. You know, when we looked at bids, especially from smaller companies, have we looked at possibly, and I mean, this might be creative thinking, merging different or sectioning off different parts of, of the routes so that way we could maybe have two or three different companies 
providing the services that we need if we don't have another competitor that's just one company big enough to do what we want to do? I think we looked at that, the concern that we had, we wanted to make sure that the company that we talked to, that will be willing to give the contract to, have the capacity to be able to service as well. And from the folks that we talked to, the smaller, they just didn't feel like they had that right now. So what we are hoping to do, we're hoping to groom a company or uh, a firm, if we have a, a scheduling change, whereby we can give them a smaller chunk so that it can function well. We don't want to set up a company and give them something bigger than they can do. So, I mean, that was, that was really part of the problem. So for example, the only other company, smaller company that expressed an interest in this, quite frankly, was Compass Transportation. But Compass said they do work in CPS. They do work with our Head Start program and early childhood program. They just did not have the capacity to do anything more at this time. And when they tell when they tell us that they don't have the capacity, what that often means is that when a bus breaks down on the way to a route, instead of sending another bus to pick up the kids, they just don't have a bus to pick up the kids. And it's like situations like that, a bigger company has has the capacity to swoop in and maybe be a little bit late, but still cover the kids and get them to school. Right. And also let's let's be clear that running a bus company requires a lot of investment, a lot of capital investment. Uh, leasing buses are not cheap. I worked in a district where we used to, we own our buses and it's very capital intensive. So a smaller company is difficult for a smaller company to get in that space and have the required capital to be viable. And we need someone to be viable. The worst thing we can do is uh, try to get a small company to get in there, doesn't have the capital and for them to go belly up in the middle of the year. Um, thank you, Raphael, so much for all your work. I think on behalf of the school bus drivers, um, I did want to just express a little bit of disappointment with um, our contractor um, in the treatment of their employees um, during this. I think if you hadn't done the work that you, you know, that you did and the negotiation that you did, um, it almost seems like they didn't really care what happened to their drivers. And so my comment is just in regards to um, you know, as a vendor, holding those vendors accountable for the type of standards and um, treatment of individuals that that we we hold our district accountable for. So the values that that we hold that we do business with individuals that hold those same values and treating people. Um, so that was you know one comment that I, I I hope that you will share with positive connections. And then the second one is that at at one point we discussed training for for bus drivers. So in terms of the work that we're doing in our school district, um, our bus drivers are very essential to the, you know, they're the first person our, our students see in the morning and the last person that they might see at the end of their day. So we had, there was um, talk at one of our meetings about asking them to invest in their staff, uh, their professional development of their staff and merging the values that we have as a district with um, what I would hope would, would um, transfer over to some of the values that they would expect um, and uphold. So those are my, my two comments with regards to the contract. I don't know if there's anything that could be included in there. There's an increase. Um, my hope is that the bus drivers will see some of that increase, but also that they will see this as an opportunity to really um, develop their bus drivers and treat them for um, the, you know, the essential part of our of our of our staff, even though they're not directly our staff, um, they they really do play a very important part in um, in the experience that our students have. Thank you for the nudge. I want to say that I agree with what you're saying. We will go back to positive, and we'll make sure before they come back they have more training with their staff. We've been asking them to do more training, and they've confirmed that they're doing those training. The other part of the the issue that you raised about increase in wages that actually accounts for a big chunk of the increase that they passed on to us. Before this year, they actually before late last year, when we started really, really going at them, they were one of the lowest paid bus company in the area. They were paying, I believe, uh, $15 an hour. They are now paying $17 an hour. And the goal is for them to get up to $18 an hour so that they can attract more drivers and more, uh, more drivers that we want. Because there's the fact is there's a shortage of drivers and not everyone could drive buses. 
you have to have a certain kind of temperament, a certain kind of personality to be able to drive buses. So that was one of the reasons why as much as the rate went up, we were somewhat fine with that because we knew the rates that bus drivers were being paid it was high, it's, it's rising, uh, commensurate to what their competitors are paying in the landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? All right, thank you for an always riveting uh, positive connections contract discussion. Uh, the finance committee recommends that the extension contract amendment number two with positive connections for in-district student transportation services for fiscal years 21 through fiscal year 23 be presented to the full board for approval. Second. You're muted, Adila. Kelpern? Yes. Tanya Budi? Yes. Kim? Yes. And our last action item, uh, the treasurer's bond renewal. Anything we should know about um, this? This is a... This is a compliance requirement yeah. by the state uh, Illinois uh, school code. And what it is essentially in its basic form is to protect the district in the case of malfeasance by the treasurer, it will reimburse the district for any money lost, stolen, or that's missing from the district purse. So what it is, is the uh, treasurer's bond will reimburse the district less deductible for any missing money. Thank you, any questions about this? If not, then uh, the Finance Committee recommends that the continuation of the treasurer's bond with a limit of $19,710,974 and an estimated annual premium of $15,769 be presented to the full board for approval. Elpern? Yes. Tanya Budi? Kim? Yes. Um, and our, our loan discussion item for uh, today is the impact of COVID-19 on uh, the fiscal year 20 budget and fiscal year 21 budget update. Um, and uh, we've got a memo and uh, some slides that you've shared with us, Kathy and Raphael. If I can just set the, uh, the conversation up. Thank you, uh, Joey. I think, I think as we all aware, the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has done a number to our finances, uh, to our economy as a country. And uh, we know there's gonna be significant impact to our revenue, as well as the expenditure of the district. What we wanted to do is we will bring additional information to the board at the June board meeting. And we just wanted to take a quick, uh, a quick uh, temperature, if you will, of where we are and what the impact of the virus will be to district's finances. And we thought a good way to do that is to do a quick PowerPoint that goes into a bit of a detail of how we perceive it today, even though the longer it goes, the, uh, the bigger the impact will be just today based on the best information we have to give the board uh, a picture of where we are financially. I'll hand it over to a copy to take it on. And for uh, those listening at home, the slides are available on our website in our board documents. And I think, Kathy, maybe if you can share the screen, we can have yeah. it viewing then also for- Yes, for let me share the presentation. Uh, and I... Can you see the presentation? Yes. Oh, great. So it, it's a brief presentation, as, as Raphael mentioned, um, uh, eight slides, but we want to highlight the most important things um, with the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, how it's affecting the current budget and um, next year's budget. And also, we want to talk about next steps. 
Um, so since uh, the stay at home order started in March, uh, luckily our, uh, there will be a limited impact on uh, property taxes. Taxes were due to the county um, by March 1st. So we are expecting to receive 100% um, of our receipts. But what we are seeing is the increase in uh, tax appeals. Um, normally, we are notified um, by the county if we get uh, appeal on uh, anything above 100,000 in value. And um, during a, a regular year, we get 510 of those. And um, I know we are already getting um, at least uh, 40, 50 this year. So as people lose their jobs, um, they are and struggling to make uh, payments. Um, these, and we're gonna see it more and more of this uh, next year. Kathy, if I can just clarify. So what that is, is anytime a taxpayer wants to appeal the value of their property, if the value of the appeal is 100,000 or more, we are notified so we can have legal representation to contest the valuation of that property. Thank you. The category of our uh, revenues that's seeing the biggest hit is other uh, 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 local revenues, primarily um, investment income. Uh, what we are seeing uh, right now, what I estimated quickly, uh, we will be um, probably losing, not collecting uh, 400,000 in interest income. Um, but there are also other uh, uh, fees uh, that will not be collected. Um, schools are shut down, therefore we're not collecting childcare fees. Uh, I'm sure there will be um, uh, an impact on our student fees, at least a delay. Uh, we're not selling lunches. So overall, we are expecting approximately one and a half million of uncollected revenues uh, this fiscal year. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty with state aid. Uh, so far, the money is coming in, but um, what, I mean, state is in, is in trouble um, um, itself. Uh, they are projecting a 2.7 short, billion shortfall this year and 7.4 billion next year. So right now, uh, I mean, information comes on daily basis. We haven't heard anything. Uh, we, we, we heard that there may be a delay uh, with some payments, um, but uh, we, haven't, we haven't heard anything concrete. Um, also, um, we were notified uh, that uh, under corona, Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act uh, CARES, the district will be receiving approximately 800000 from federal government, uh, but we don't know um, yet if it's going to be this fiscal year, so before June 30th, or you know after Ju uh, June uh, June 30th. Kathy, if I can jump in, the way the CARES Act, we are supposed to get the money. It's actually the state of Illinois is supposed. The application is open on Friday, and the state is supposed to fill out the application, and then the state will actually get the money, and then they'll flow it through to school mm -hmm. district. What I want to point out, the state has a really lousy record when it comes to passing money from the federal government to school districts. Yes. There's no requirement that they give us the money at a particular time. And since the state is in financial trouble, there's a good possibility that the state will probably sit on that money and pay us when they feel like it or when they can afford it. You're absolutely right, right, Rafael. And we saw actually the same thing in 2009 and 2010 with our money they were releasing money um, very slowly to us. So we, we may experience the same thing. Uh, so overall, we are projecting um, one and a half uh, million uh, shortfall in this fiscal year, FY20. Um, on the expenditure side, uh, there are additional expenditures due to remote learning, uh, hotspots um, for internet, uh, security network upgrades, um, payroll expenditures continue as normal, um, but we will see um, some savings in non-personnel expenditures, primarily from utilities, uh, unspent uh, supplies, um, and purchase services. So overall, we are projecting the expenditures to be under budget. 
uh, which um, again, the, the, we don't know the full picture yet, but some of these savings in expenditure should cover the short, shortfall in our revenues. I included this slide, um, which is a, 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 a picture of our latest, um, official latest projections, financial projections from February. And even though they're only three months old, I mean, they were presented on uh, February 3rd. I mean, it seems like eternity and a lot has changed um, since, uh, since February. And, and back then we were projecting um, um, balanced budgets through FY23, uh, that's the third line. Um, of course, it's, it's, it's no longer a case. Um, we, we're not gonna have uh, a balanced budget uh, next year. Uh, and um, we, even at the last, at our last uh, meeting in, in March, we talked about recession. Well, now we know that recession is, is absolutely certain, especially with um, historic unemployment uh, numbers and with pandemic still unfolding. Um, it's very hard to estimate the impact of, of the pandemic, but um, I mean, we certain the recession is coming. There are a lot of different forecasts out there and I'm sure you, you've seen them all. There are um, um, some project very, very, very short recession and quick recovery, uh, but there is, there is a lot more, there's a lot more voices actually saying that it's gonna be um, uh, probably a longer uh, um, uh, recession and, and, and very, very slow recovery. Um, especially with the second wave of uh, pandemic um, coming possibly in the fall. So in any case, whether it's a short recovery or long recovery, we're going to lose revenues next year. And if I can just, Kathy, if I can just explain. So just so we know, 80% of our revenue comes from property taxes. And uh, that's, that's where it becomes tricky when people are not working. When folks are not working, it's hard for them to make their mortgage payment. And if they don't make mortgage payment, it's hard, it's hard for them to pay their property taxes. And another big component of the property tax collection is that we have a pretty decent base of commercial property in Evanston. We have hotels, we have a residential apartment, we have office buildings here. And in the last two months at least, None of those vendors, hotels have no little or no occupancy. And a lot of businesses are not receiving rent payment from their uh, commercial buildings are not receiving rent payment from their tenant. Neither are apartment buildings receiving a rent from their, uh, from their residents. And so what, what is happening is the assessor is actually talking about going back and redo reassessing a lot of the property in Evanston. Now, if that happened, the value of our EAV will go will go down, and so we've we've always had a pretty good uh, collection rate in our property taxes. It's always been about ninety nine percent collection rate. But if you have an economy where folks are not working, where business are not in a position to pay their their property taxes, then what would what we are what we are projecting right now, which the number may get uglier, is that we're looking at a collection rate from ninety nine percent to at least 96%. And the longer this goes on, the lower we believe the collection rate is. But we are in uncharted territory. I just wanted to point that out. What we are trying to do, we're trying to use the best available information right now to make a projection. But I will say the longer this goes on, the nasty is gonna be for our revenue base. And, and currently we, we, we worry specifically about the commercial base. We know that uh, approximately 50% of individuals are on escrows, um, so that should be covered. But as Raphael pointed out, hotels were vacant, businesses are closed, uh, they're not paying rent, they're not uh, paying, uh, 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 so, so, so the landlords cannot make these, these other payments. And uh, so that's gonna be reflected in the um, adjusted um, collection rate. Uh, which we are projecting to be 96%, but it will be changed if we get additional information. Um, and again, 
it's a it's a trickle effect. Uh, CPPRT, uh, which is a um, a corporate uh, property personal replacement tax, it's a tax that that businesses pay to the state because. Um, they are not producing, they are not open, um, they, they not paying. Uh, so we taking, um, 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 we, we taking it down, but at least 25%. Um, investment income, we taking down by 75%. So that's probably additional million uh, that's not gonna be there um, as we previously thought. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty with state funding. As we said, they are they rely heavily on sales tax, on income tax, which is all now being delayed or gone. Um, so we 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 talking with our peers, we talking with financial institutions, and we are fine tuning our assumptions for the budget. Um, as of right now, uh, we are projecting 4.4 million in revenue less. In comparison, in comparison with the with the prior projections, so that that is uh, what we are estimate estimating currently, uh, but it may change. Uh, it may change when you see the draft tentative budget next um, next month. So, because we have to have by law, we have to have a balanced budget. Uh, we working um, really hard to reduce expenditures, so the budget is balanced next year. Um, we are going to be implementing operating efficiencies, some of them that were mentioned last month. Um, we will be implementing attrition uh, for positions that are currently vacant um, and positions there are non classroom positions, um, uh, which we can can be absorbed by other departments, other people. Um, except for the extreme cases um, and also also, of course, hiring freeze. Uh, we are we're negotiating contracts for services. Um, we going basically through the budget and looking for items in our budget that can be um, renegotiated, uh, possibly a phone, uh, um, um, a contract or uh, um, a copy a contract. Um, we just renegotiated um, transportation contract. Unfortunately, it's, it's a high increase. Um, we will be substantially reducing consulting services and out of this and out of state professional development. Um, we're going to be uh, reducing expenditures without affecting teaching and learnings and delaying some expenditures. Our budget last two years had a million twenty five for building uh, capital uh, capital building projects. We will be delaying these uh, building projects. Uh, that doesn't mean that the, we won't have any work done on our buildings. Um, uh, last year, we, we sent, this year, actually, we sold bonds, 4.4 uh, uh, in bonds. Um, so we will be spending down those pr proceeds um, on our buildings. Um, oh, we Kathy, if I can just jump in. I know the board made a commitment of that $1,025,000 a year. But I think with the situation that we're in and the fact that there are so many unknowns, there's a limit on the reduction that we can do. 80% of our expenditure is tied with, with salary. So there's a reduction in the flexibility we have with expenditures. So one of the areas that we have some flexibility, at least we think, is that million twenty-five thousand dollars And I think the timing was kind of good in the fact that we have those bonds refinanced so we can actually spend more money that we had anticipated spending on capital projects. So being deferring that million, 25,000 in 21 to uh, future years will allow us to lower the, uh, the deficit that we, we project will probably happen in 21. We also working with our IT director, jo Joe Caravella to see which um, technology projects um, can be delayed. We're looking at software products and see what uh, uh, product potentially, if there is any duplication can be re reduced. Um, we also um, planning to prepay some items in our budget, uh, and this is this, this is deja vu from from, from years um, a few years back uh, when we did prepay uh, workers' compensation and commercial uh, property liability insurance. We're going to be prepaying them 
uh, again, um, just those two items add to 700,000. And again, because we're gonna have some of these expenditures unspent in the current budget, we can absorb these expenditures this year, bring up room in next year's expenditures. So as a result, we, um, FY21 budget should be balanced. We are confident with the information that we have um, um, today that we will be bringing to you a balanced budget unless something drastic happens and of which we have no control. We're gonna be looking at short and long-term solutions. Again, make sure we balance next year's budget but also um, something, um, a project for what we were getting ready anyways to make sure that we have uh, a long-term um, uh, financial uh, um, solvency as a district. Uh, we also will be bringing um, uh, updated financial projections and, um, and updated um, referendum reserves. I just want to jump in, thanks, Kathy, and say we can't overstate the importance of that referendum that was passed in 2017. Without that referendum right now on the state of the economy, we'll actually be looking at short-term borrowing, especially with what we're hearing that the second installment of the 2019 levy, which is due in August, may be delayed for three months. So if we didn't have that reserve that we've been husbanding, we will actually will run into cash flow problems. So that reserve has been very helpful to cushion us, at least in the short term, to make sure we don't have to go out and borrow money at a high rate of interest. So these are next steps in, um, in the budget um, creation and adoption. We will be bringing a draft tentative budget to you on June 1st. Um, tentative budget will be presented to the board finance committee and to the full board in August and then we will have a public hearing on the tentative budget in September, and finally adoption of the budget um, in September. Questions? That's all we have. Thank you. Um, that was sobering. Um, John, you had a question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, when you were talking about the additional expenditures for remote learning, um, I kind of missed that part. Could you kind of clarify that part for me again? Where are the additional expenditures for remote learning? Can I jump in, Kathy? So part of the things that we spend money on, we spend money on a bunch of hotspots for our families who do not have uh, internet collection at home. We project that cost to be $96,000 alone. What we also did is we, uh, we reached agreement with some of our software providers like Seesaw and Zoom to provide us e-learning tools that we can, that will allow our students at home and our teachers to be able to provide instruction. Those are expenditures that we are nearly, we're not out. We've never had Zoom before, we're buying Zoom. And Seesaw, we had Seesaw before, but we are standing the capability of Seesaw so that we can provide more services to our, to our family and our students at home. So those are some of those uh, software and technology related expenses that are tied to e-learning. So I wanna say, um, I think that the fact that you you all were able to get Chromebooks out to so many families, that you were able to get these hotspots, I think that was an incredible job by so many people on so many different levels. And I've told so many people how proud I am of our district that we were able to do those things and take care of our families because so many people were saying that, you know, that families that don't have access to those things, how they are so adversely affected during this time and increasing that gap and the efforts that um, the teachers, administrators that you all put in to try to make sure that that happened um, was phenomenal. So, you know, being it at the, the teacher center, you know, that, that Friday morning trying to get copies together myself at 7 a.m., seeing all the people there working so hard trying to get things out to people uh, was very impressive. And so, I want to give a shout out to all you all, to all those administrators and teachers that did so much in such a short period of time and continue to do things to make sure that we're serving the needs of those people, I think is really important. So thank you for that. Um, John, did, thank you. I, I got to jump in and say the credit goes to, it's a team effort, to the folks at uh, Curriculum and Instruction, to Technology Group. A lot of people in the district office did a lot of work to make that happen. 
So I want them to get the credit. Thank you, John, for recognizing that. Well, I know that they were there the night before to like midnight, one o'clock, trying to get things together. Um, I know myself, many other teachers were cramming, trying to put things together. And then, like I said, I was at JEH that morning, really early that Friday morning, trying to get packets and stuff together. And I saw so many people there working so hard. So that was incredible effort in such a short period of time. Um, when we were talking about the, um, the hiring freeze for next year, so can we kind of expand on that? Like, what are we looking at for that? So I know that we were saying that we're gonna try through the through attrition to try to freeze out some of those positions. I know that we were originally looking at maybe hiring some new positions. So can we just kind of talk about what that attrition free, you know, that hiring freeze looks like? Sure, so I think what uh, Kathy stated is, as far as we know right now, there's no attempted freeze on instructional positions because we recognize we're in the business of education student achievement, raising student achievement. So in all the things that we've done over the years, we've tried to keep cuts away from the classroom. So what we're talking about as far as attrition and position freeze are non-instructional position. And we look at those and see which one of those positions can we do without, without significantly impacting the function of the district. People, some folks, people, naturally people move on in life sometimes. Some people retire, some people move out of state, some people decide to get a job somewhere else. So those are the positions that we're talking about, non-instructional position. And before we go ahead and fill those positions, what we will look at is, are there resources internally that can take on those responsibilities without necessarily hiring additional people? Those are the positions that we're talking about. The non-instructional vacancies that, that are currently in existence in the district that we can, we can find a way to provide those functions without additional personnel. So um, am I correct then that there's not gonna be any new positions for admin positions or at JEH? Because I thought that there were gonna be some new positions that we were creating before all this happened. I said non-instructional. Right. So the positions that will be created in JEH, those are instructional positions. Those are folks who support schools directly in the classrooms. So I don't think when we're thinking about that, we're not thinking about those types of positions because at the end of the day, they support educators in the classroom. They support the administrators in the school. Those, I think we, we, we kind of feel like we need those in order to be able to raise the level of student achievement in our schools. Okay. And I would like to add that we were looking at attrition even before the pandemic. Um, we started looking at the functions, non-instructional uh, positions and um, um, possibilities to absorb these functions in other departments, um, especially with um, um, programs downstairs when, when there are additional functions um, such as bookkeeping functions and HR functions. So if, if there was a duplication or if we were able to maybe shift some of these responsibilities, um, we started this process already, um, even before the pandemic. I wanted to step in and just talk a little bit about, uh, and again, thank you, uh, Kathy and Raphael for a glimpse into you know, a bleak issue that we're gonna be talking about in regards to budget. It's never easy to talk about money. Um, in regards to the comment around, again, the state agencies and the state being very slow and uh, giving, uh, giving us the money that we're supposed to be getting. Uh, I just wanna um, uh, not sit here, you know, not let us sit here and, and kind of just wait for the state to do things, Let, let's push. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I, I'm asking my, my board colleagues as well as our, our union colleagues to reach out to our uh, state reps uh, to make sure that we push the state, uh, to make sure that we get payments when we're, when we're supposed to get them. Uh, we should definitely be proactive in pushing um, you know, our, our state agencies to, to really you know, give us the money for early childhood. Um, again, any, 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 any grant programs that we are our district benefits from, again, we should be proactive in, in making sure that we tell our state reps and senators to push on that end. Uh, another thing I wanna talk about too is again, you know, we, we also get federal funding, and uh, I talked about this before, but really thinking about uh, making sure that we as a district remind folks that uh, to, to fill out the U.S. Census. Uh, again, we want to make sure that people are counted because that, you know, counting people equals money. 
uh, and, and particularly for our more our, 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 uh, more vulnerable populations in this community. So again, looking at that system, the, the bigger um, bird's eye view in regards to how we get money uh, to ensure that we uh, there's a continuity in trying to, in our efforts to raise uh, the achievement of for students and, and outcomes for families in Evanston. Uh, again, thinking about those two things and being proactive as, as, as board members, as well as union members, teacher union members, uh, and writing families to, you know, partake and, and, and get counted uh, in order for us to get the federal funding that really, at the end of the day, impacts all Evanstonians and particularly our most vulnerable. Sunny? Yeah, so thank you, Sergio, for bringing that up. I think that's um, incredibly <clears throat> important, an important reminder uh, to, for people to fill out their census. Um, I was on an Ed Red call earlier this afternoon, and uh, you know they also reiterated the importance of school districts reaching out to state reps um, to not just push for whatever federal monies we might be owed, but just in general to make sure that our state representatives are aware of any cash flow issues that we might have or, or some of the specific um, uh, challenges that, that financial challenges that we're facing, um, that there are working committees right now trying to figure all of this out. And so um, we have an opportunity to influence that conversation. Uh, I also wanted to just on the point about um, any new admin positions. Uh, I know in the past, whenever there's been any restructuring or creating that, we've always um, given the guidance that it needs to, as much as possible, be cost neutral. And my understanding is that is also going to be the case this time around, that there might be some general restructuring um, in admin positions at JEH, and that uh, to the extent that, that those are going to be cost neutral restructuring. Um, and then I, the other thing I just wanted to clarify, when I was on the Ed Red call this, morning, uh, this afternoon, and I may have been misunderstanding this in terms of the, the federal money through the CARES Act, it was sounding from the ISPE representative who was, uh, was on the conversation, and she was cutting out, so that's why I may not have um, fully understood her. It sounded like, like the $800,000 that you were talking about is not necessarily guaranteed to come to us, not just because there are delays in getting state funding, but that we actually have to apply to ISB to get that money and to qualify for it. Is that, did I misunderstand something on that? The last guidance that we got from ISB, ISB said they will be doing the application. And then once they do the application, they'll be letting us know the process that we have to use to receive okay. the money. That was the last, uh, the last guidance that we got from ASB. Okay. And that was supposed to take place last Friday. And we haven't heard anything else from them. I will say a lot of the conversation this afternoon from ISB and just in general uh, through the whole Ed Red meeting was a lot of, we don't know how that's gonna work yet. So I think there is still at the state level quite a bit of uncertainty about how things are gonna unfold. Um, but that makes it all the more important for us, I think, to reach out to our state reps. Uh, and let them know what we need. I really appreciate the, the conversation. I think um, for me, this is one of those times where, um, you know, I think that sometimes doing the right thing is the more expensive thing um, and kind of putting the hotspots is a great example, but it's also an example of something where uh, if people can get engaged in helping redefine the responsibility for uh, healthcare and feeding our children and um, what uh, internet access to be like for our community, for our society. Um, these are things that, um, you know, staff have done an amazing job uh, making sure that these things needs are getting met, um, you know, from the school district. And uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be doing it. I'm saying that we shouldn't be doing it alone. Um, and uh, you know, schools are supposed to be nonpartisan places. That doesn't mean they're supposed to be passive places. So uh, people can advocate within the community in the ways that they can um, to, uh, to their leadership and um, see if we can have a better discussion about how to share these, these burdens because they're all our kids um, and they all need to be fed and taken care of and have access to learning even when we're not in school. Um, so thank you for doing the, the big lifts you guys are doing and for kind of foreshadowing for us the work you have ahead. Um, it sounds like an immense burden. Um, 
you know, to, to reduce expenditures as a result of attrition means you've got to be monitoring enrollment in a different way and um, like all, all kinds of things. So thank you for uh, keeping a keen eye on those things and talking about uh, putting money into our buildings for construction. Just sounds like it's going to be more expensive later, but you know, we got to make choices um, now. So thank you for at least uh, being candid with us about, about those things. Um, are there any other questions about kind of the fi financial outlook? I assume this is something on a monthly basis we'll probably revisit and get an update on as some of these unknowns and worries become actual numbers and situations. Um, are there any other questions from anybody? Can I just make one additional comment? Um, yeah. You know, before school closed and as we were, were uh, preparing to just even talking about next year and how we were going to look at trying to reduce some expenditures um, to, to bring the structural deficit into a little bit more control. Um, you know, as a board, we had talked about, we wanted to make sure that there was proper time built in for stakeholder engagement um, as before we make, you know, particularly drastic plans. Um, I think even though I understand that this is a situation that is changing pretty rapidly and we don't have any idea what the full extent of the, the impact is gonna be um, on our budget. I think as much as, you know, in our monthly meetings, finance committee meetings and, and just going forward, as much as we can build in some opportunities for some stakeholder engagement around what is, what are some difficult choices we may need to be making in the future. Um, I think we just make sure that we're keeping that in mind as we're continuing this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our next finance meeting is uh, June 1st. And before we adjourn the finance meeting, um, I think uh, we have a comment from Meg. And before I pass it off to Meg, I just wanted to say this is the start of Teacher Appreciation Week this week. Um, if we weren't already so grateful for those superheroes and on the screens uh, interacting with our kids, now's a really good time for anybody out there in Zoom land to open up your email and write a note. Um, and share a, a heartfelt word to, to people who have really had to redefine themselves as professionals um, it, with no time, with no notice, with no training or support really. Um, you know, nothing but a, a network of uh, keeping connected to each other and figuring it out on the fly and doing an amazing job for our children um, and really supporting parents and trying to make it work at home too. So a big shout out to all the educators in District 65. Thank you for, uh, for a tremendous, uh, work the past few weeks and for the rest of this year and uh, hope this is just the beginning of us appreciating you in a different way this week. All right, so Meg, you got something to say before we adjourn? Yeah, thanks, Joey. I, d I definitely just wanted to take a minute to recognize that today is the first day of Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, we know we're in unusual times. But on behalf of the District 65 Educators Council, we wanted to express our extreme gratitude to our educators and staff who are working to support students and families. Um, during the beginning of this crisis, our educators gave their all in new learning, creating a smooth transition for our students and centering their social and emotional well being. They continue to reach out to students and families with compassion and understanding while grappling with their own feelings and their own families at this time. Oh. As an esteemed colleague and mentor said it today, thank you for caring for each student, for teaching every student that they are valued, for teaching every student that they can learn and are respected for who they are and who they will become. We wanna acknowledge their hard work and honor them. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, we will adjourn this finance meeting at 8.37 p.m.